So, hello? Yes, so let's continue. Sorry for uh, delay, we had some discussion. So, please uh, open software called, uh, called uh, Neural Machine, and we will now build a neural network uh, to uh, imitate, to uh, reproduce the sine function and cosine function. So on the slide here, you see the data set I prepared uh, for this uh, uh, small exercise. So what I did, I simply, uh, in Excel, ran um, uh, 315, uh, uh, generated 315 examples using as input x, ranging from 0 to 2 pi, 628, you see this? Uh, with the step of 0, 0, 2, so it makes 315 examples. Okay, this. And then uh, I uh, calculated uh, output. There are two outputs in this neural network, will be two. One is sine, sine function, which ranges from 0, uh, reaches 1, and then goes back to uh, 0. Uh, so reaches one, then zero, then minus, and then back to zero. Okay. And second output is cosine function, cosine, which starts with one and then goes like this. Okay. So I generated. So I want to use this data to train neural network to uh, calculate outputs y1 and y2. With one input, two outputs. A bit strange model, but okay, that's what I wanted to do. Just to demonstrate that this model is able to handle two outputs instead of one. Now, I have a test case of 12 instances. They were also generated using sine and cosine function, but with a bit of noise, deliberately. Just to show that there is some difference. So that's what we will do. So, uh, I invite you to go to folder called uh, NNN. This is neural machine. Okay, you have it. And please start neural machine. Executable. You should see this screen. Have it? Great. So then open existing project. And uh, find uh, the project which is called syncos79.anf. Syncos79.env. Actually, in this file, there are not 315 examples, but only 79. So, uh, selection of these examples. So, if you look at data, if you click here, so this software allows you to also to view data a bit. Uh, so attributes, all attributes. You see there are two inputs, sorry, one input and two outputs. These two outputs. Output variables. You cannot click on because it's on. Yeah, so if you... So this is uh, output. You see like it looks like sine function. It output one. And this is output two. You see, it looks like cosine function. You see this? If you click on training data 3D view, this is the training data. And the table here uh, has 79 examples going from 0 to uh, 2pi, to 628, almost 624. And here step is not 002 like on my slide, but 008, as you see. Okay, so it's a bigger step. Anyway. First I'll train the model, and then we'll discuss what is, a, is in this uh, model. So I will be training the model, which is neural network. We discussed it. So if you go to plot, menu option plot, and click display network structure. See this? This is the network structure, you see? It has two, uh, one input. So why there are two inputs going in? 
because the second here input uh, is not really input, it is a free term in the linear regression equation. It is that A0 thing which gives A zeros to all of these hidden nodes. You remember there is A0 plus a summation of inputs. So this is A0 and then summation of these inputs, and inputs only one. Uh, same here. So this black thing is not a hidden node, no. It is this B0. It's in that uh, linear regression equation, B0, and these are weights here going uh, uh, f for all of these uh, uh, five hidden nodes. So here you have more complex equation you know, with five inputs. Is this clear? Shall I go back to the neural network plot to connect? I don't see my mouse, yes. It's this neural network you, you have. So we have one input here, five hidden nodes, and two output nodes. So equation here is linear regression with A, and the equation here is linear regression with B. This is slide number seven. So if you forgot. Now, what I will do now, I will not, uh, well, let me first train neural network and see how it goes. So I click train model, and nothing happens. Yeah, here, train. See this button train? Yes, are, we, are you with me? No questions from Northeast Brazil? Good. So click train, and you will see how neural network is trained. Do you have that? Yes, it works? Great. So, excellent, so stop. Now look, it's perfect fit, you see? So neural network, this is sine function, but the same is for cosine function, if we display it, you, will, you can see it uh, as well. So it's perfect fit. So neural network is able, uh, reading 79 examples, to uh, find these weights, A and B, vectors of weights, and now it can absolutely accurately, almost absolutely accurately, you see scatter plot is very, very nice here, to reproduce uh, this relationship. And sine function is very nonlinear, you know. So it's very far from linear function. It has waves and all this. And tra uh, verification set here on the scatter, you see bl blue points, it's verification set of 12 examples. So it's also very good. So if you click on verify and report, well, it's not ideal, actually because there is noise, but it's also close. That's verification. So this data here, target is uh, green line. This is data that I offer, inputs I offer to neural network. It never saw these inputs, never. And it is able to give output which is close to the output which was in the test set. Okay? Now let's make an experiment and reduce number of hidden nodes. So I would like to remind you that you have here five hidden nodes. So it's quite a complex model. So how many weights are we training here? How many coefficients are in this model, actually? You simply have to count number of black lines, and that many. So it is <laughs> here one by five. It's uh, uh, 10 plus 10, 20, plus uh, five, uh, uh, it's, uh, it gives <coughs> 30. 32 weights. So we're searching for optimal point, minimum error, in the 32-dimensional space. Because our decision variables are these weights, A and B, in the equations. Okay? So we found a vector of 32-dimensional weights. I can show you this vector if you're interested. So these weights being put into this formula give you the uh, accurate uh, output and the error is close to zero very very low error but let's reduce number of hidden nodes maybe it's too complex this model maybe we don't need 32 weights maybe we could do it with less weights 
And let's start with, if you go to set model and you say, let's have only one hidden node, one. So if we plot the network now, it looks like this. Okay, again, we, we click on the set model button, big button, and hidden nodes here was five, but I made it uh, only one, okay? And we go to menu, op menu plot and choose option display network structure, and this is the network structure. So how many weights we're training now? One, two, plus four, six weights, much less. But let's see if this uh, model is good. So we're running now optimization process, which I will discuss later, how we're doing this. And maximum it can do, actually this is logistic function, just inversed. It tries to fit the, the plot, but it can't. But anyway, it's nonlinear, so at least something. So uh, optimization still continues, but error, so number of iterations still running. So we are trying to solve this gradient search problem moving in the space of six weights, but it doesn't help. We already, error here doesn't drop, doesn't go down. We still continue, but we should stop. It doesn't improve. So that's maximum which we can achieve with the one hidden node. Stop. So let's go to set model again and make two hidden nodes. Network structure looks like this now. We have uh, three by two, six plus four, 10 weights now. Two hidden nodes. So maybe complexity increased enough to reproduce the sine function. Train, let's see. Look, interesting, some lively movements. But it's even worse. So what happened here? I will tell you. Uh, you could improve it, but neural network got into a local minima. So it went with the gradient search, reached local minima, it cannot get out of, it, of there. Why? Because gradient search assumes single extremum. So this algorithm, which is used backpropagation algorithm, uh, got stuck. But we can help it. What we do now, so in this 10 dimensional space, we, you know, the error function looks like this and maybe there is global minimum here, but we're, I think, somewhere in the local minimum. What we'll do now, we make a random jump in the 10 dimensional space. I add random additions to all weights. So it will jump out and end up somewhere else in the 10 dimensional space and the process of uh, gradient search would continue then. So there is a button called shake. It's a random jump, let's see. And is it better? Let's see. Not much better. Let's shake again. Look, it's now different. So we made another random jump and we got to an area of 10 dimensional space where error becomes lower or not. Let's see, 5.557. So this is the error, mean squared error on training. Uh, Cross-validation also changes. So it changes a bit, but actually it's stabilized. 547, 10 minus 2. I wonder if we could improve it. So please remember this error, 546. It still goes down a bit, 559, 545. It's a bit going down, but maybe you can do better. So let's remember it, 544, better. No, doesn't help. Let's stop here. Well, if we stop and do verify and report, you see on verification, not good, not good enough. So let's continue increasing complexity of the model again. We now make three hidden nodes. Neural network looks like this. So it is what, uh, three by two, six, plus two by three, six, 12 weights. Let's train and see what happens. Oh, look at this. Error dropped to one to 10 to, 10 to the power three, minus three. 
almost perfect fit with three nodes. You see? So we made quantum leap, adding just one node. We suddenly uh, got what we wanted. Let's try to shape. So error is really small, 5 to the 10 to the power minus 3. Really small error. Let's shake. Maybe we'll improve something. Nice, isn't it? As if it's a living snake. Eh? Impresses people. Not really, but it's already very good. So if we stop and verify, okay, not bad at all. So this structure with uh, three hidden nodes is enough, more or less. We could increase it to four. You will get even better result. Let's see if it's true. Almost perfect fit with four nodes. Five would be the same. It wouldn't be better. So that's how we play with this complexity of the data-driven model, increasing number of functions. It means complexity increases. Of course, model becomes more complex, but it becomes more accurate. So you see, so it's, uh, I think, nice sort of demo to demonstrate how uh, you have to deal with, uh, with mm, building the data-driven models. Now, uh, let me ask you. So. This model is almost perfect now on training. But we agreed that you should not push the model to be absolutely accurate on training. You should try to make a model uh, accurate on cross-validation set. So please have this in mind every time you're training complex models. But here, function is so simple, actually, that whatever you do in training would be the same on cross-validation set because it's coming from very nice function without any noise. There is no noise. But if I would add noise, it may be different. Maybe then if I have noise here in that function here, it would try to reproduce this noise if I push training further, increase complexity, and then your error on cross-validation would, would uh, start to increase, maybe. So it's interesting. If you want, you can play with this example and try to introduce noise. Take this file in Excel, add some noise, and uh, see what happens. So again, you have to minimize error on cross-validation in general. But you always start with training because it's easiest. And then it should be iterative procedure in building up the models. Any questions here? No? Any questions from other side of Brazil? No. Good. So then we'll continue. That was more demo because example is so simple. By the way, this software has some bugs uh, due to this file management, as I told you, because changes in Windows made changes to some system calls. So if you want to open another project, my advice you to close this software, open again, and open another project. Don't do it when you have this project open. You can do it, but it may something is happening. Maybe it's my bug in uh, uh, some initialization of variables. So you may have different things. OK, uh, save to disk, say no. But maybe I'll show you another example. Let me see, just a moment. Open projects. Ah, Apura, I showed you this. So Apura data has um, uh, 25 inputs and one output. Much more complex model. And if we train it, You see it trains quite fast. You can run stepwise also and see how it develops. But look, scatter plot, how nice it is. So why it is wobbling like this? Because my steps in gradient search are not really optimal. So it you know, jumps a bit like this around the minimum. In principle, well-designed algorithms of gradient search, when it starts doing this, they should stop somehow or reduce the step. So it's not uh, perfect. Well, you could control these algorithms by changing these parameters, actually. You see this? So I increase step here. Oh, now, if I decrease the step, it gets to perfect. You see, if a kappa is 0, then. And if I do it a bit bigger, it may 
jump out of the nice area and disappear somewhere because number of weights here is extremely high. Look, if you plot the structure, it's this structure. So I have 25 inputs multiplied by how many nodes? 10 nodes, so it's already 250 weights plus 10 by 1, uh, 260 weights. So in this dimensional space, we're searching for minimum, so quite a lot. Right, let's get back to uh, presentation. I want now to move on. Yes. Okay, we discussed all this. Now, I'm writing down here the overall uh, error. So look, this is, uh, <coughs> Z is network output. So it's denoted here by Z, not Y, because Y is used for uh, hidden node output. So this is output, this is value F is not a function, sorry, it's de no notation from some books, and I used it. This F is actual value, observed value of output. So this is a squared error. This half traditionally comes in machine learning books. Why? Because it's coming from Gaussian distribution error, and this half from there somehow transported here. You can easily delete one half. It wouldn't change anything. So look, I'm writing down now the error, and this is full notation for the, uh, for the error. So look, Z is output of the neural network, okay? But this output is this. This is out uh, 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 for that neuron, it's output, linear regression plus G function. But Y is output of the hidden node, remember? So I write down Y here, and this is li linear combination. God bless you. Linear combination of inputs here, right? G and again G. So this function we want to minimize. It's analytical function differentiable, easily to find derivatives. You remember G, derivative of Z. So if you find derivatives with respect to A and B, you can formulate the gradient-based uh, search algorithm in uh, multiple dimensional spaces. And this space has, uh, is in the space of decision variables. And these variables are A, many A's, A, I, G, and B, this B, and B0, A0. So uh, this part of presentation presents to you how you can derive it, consult books. Uh, if you want to know details, how to write down the equations for derivatives, so I'll show you actually this algorithm, no need to do it. So gradient-based search, you see weight is A, B weights written one after another. It's standard, you said you know nonlinear optimization, it's a standard S uh, equation for the step n plus 1 having. So this is weight at uh, iteration n when we do gradient-based uh, uh, descent. And this iteration n plus 1, and this is the gradient. It's derivative of the error with respect to the weight. And so you have to find this uh, co coefficient. And if you write down, you use chain rule to write down all these derivatives. I wouldn't go into detail. And uh, uh, you would formulate uh, the optimization problem. Now, why uh, Verbos called it uh, backpropagation? Uh, I think the reason is this. Uh, simply, look, when we look at the neural network, we have error in the end uh, let me go to slide uh, slide seven. So what we do, we calculate error in the end with respect to observed. You see F is observed, Z is output. We calculate the error. And then we uh, want to update these weights in such a way that this error would become smaller. So in steepest descent method, we do the same, where at this point, if this is space of variables, x1, x2 function looks up, 
we do steepest descent, so we calculate gradient, which points that way. We go minus gradient, and we make a step, changing weights, changing values of inputs, so that error becomes smaller. And this is called backpropagation of the error to the weights. So backpropagation means we propagate error back across the neural network to the weights. That's it. But from the point of, of, of person who is doing just purely optimization, there is no need to introduce this notion of bad propagation. It's just standard uh, gradient search. That's it. Nothing else. It's just new term for the same thing. Okay? And people write in books and repeat from paper to paper that we, we use back propagation. Okay, yes, maybe you can call it back propagation. But in fact, it's nothing else than the standard sorry, the standard equation for the update of weights in, uh, in uh, nonlinear optimization. That's a standard thing, okay? Just for you to be aware about terminology when you read about this. And currently, to, uh, uh, to train neural network, we do not use the, these equations, actually. We use traditional algorithms for backpropagation. This is taken from books when people didn't know what uh, perhaps nonlinear optimization is, or they knew, but they were repeating stories from previous authors, one after another. Uh, and they invented additional adaptive learning rate and all this stuff. So, okay, it improves the process of uh, steepest descent, so to say, yes. But uh, you would better look into books written 30 years ago where it was done, but much better. Developing algorithm is using second derivatives and all this uh, conjugate gradient methods and uh, Newton methods. So that uh, would be advice also. So currently, if you want to build neural network, you would better take Python codes or MATLAB codes where all of it was already implemented and solved quickly, efficiently, and robustly. Okay? Uh, so that's an advice for you to do. Okay, anyway, that's uh, how learning rates. This is how it's implemented in, in the software. I just took what uh, Smith wrote in his book of 93. It was nice, interesting to play with this. But it, it introduces number of this kappa. You remember you saw it. I was changing this kappa. So it's just a way uh, to improve uh, uh, training. Right. Okay. So then, aha. Uh -huh. Okay, let's skip this. Now, important thing. If you look at logistic function, uh, question to you, what happens if, look, every output of the node is a logistic function there, you remember. Its value is between 0 and 1, okay? Uh, also, output's value, output neurons, I said we have logistic function there. But your output is discharge, isn't it? It's between 2,000 and 4,000 or something. Zero and 4,000. How can you reproduce discharge of these large values using as output? You remember, there is a function which has values between 0 and 1. How do you do it? Yes, exactly. So before you apply any neural network, you have to normalize data. So you take output values and use, yesterday I showed you the formula, normalization, so that all the data is between 0 and 1. Okay, please remember this. Many software packages do it automatically for you, but please check that you would use the check mark somewhere where it says normalization or not. Okay? Sometimes it's done automatically. Okay. Now I'm telling you this. So you had your discharge between zero and, two, and, and uh, zero, and uh, so camera follows this board as well. Uh huh. Good. So look, <coughs> your output uh, uh, output in time. So was between zero and okay, one thousand. This discharge. So it was uh, changing like this, okay, and so on. This is your training set. What you did, you normalized this into 0, 0,1. 
Does it move? Maybe better for the camera? I would love to if this would work. Oh, yeah, it works partly. Okay, so that's my discharge, okay? So you normalize it into, no, it doesn't. So normalize it into zero, one range. And you train the network. So when you would get the new data coming in, the neural network would tell you something between zero and one. So I have to denormalize it back to normal discharges, okay? And what if your uh, new data is 1,100? It may happen that the new discharges that neural network would, should tell you is 1,100. So let's take tra test set. Imagine that test set has a value 1,100 in the output. Will net neural network be able to tell you 1,100 or not? No. Because 1,100 being normalized becomes 1.1, and sigmoid function never has value 1.1. So neural network would tell you maximum is 1. So it will make an automatically 10% error. Conclusion is that you should not normalize it to 0 0.1, but better into 0 0.1, 0 0.9, something like this. In this case, for training set, neural network would be generating values between 0 0.1, 0 0.9, but for new data, which could be just a bit above the maximum value in the training set, like 1,100, it would generate one. It's okay. And it would be accurate uh, calculation. Okay? So that's what you can read more details in the books. Think of normalization to a narrow range. It would not change anything. Neural network would be as good as this, but it would be allowed to extrapolate. It will extrapolate beyond the training set range. Now, another thing, network paralysis. Network paralysis happens when input to the sigmoid function is high. So if it's 1, then it's 0 0.76 output. If it's 2, 0 0.96. But then when input to the sigmoid function increases to 4, 5, 6, output becomes almost 1. Whatever you do with the weights, you remember, this input coming from linear regression model inside, from the linear combination of inputs. And whatever you do with the weights, if it changes from 4 to 3.5, it would not change much output. So it means there would be paralysis. You try to optimize, you try to move weights, but output would not change at all. So neural network, we say, is paralyzed. It would not train. So to prevent this, there are different tricks invented in algorithms, and one of them is to ensure that weights are small enough, initial weights, so that this internals, values of initial values of weights should be small enough so that when multiplied by inputs, multiplied by inputs, uh, they would not end up with high values here. That's another thing to take into account. Okay, so now where are we? Yes, deep learning networks. So deep learning networks, it's a term appeared recently, but in fact it's this, uh, well, there are different types of networks. I don't want to generalize, but many of them is just the same MLP network with maybe slightly different functions in nodes. Uh, but important is that you have many, many layers in it and you have millions of weights, millions or hundreds of thousands of weights. So training of them because a, a bit different problem because you have different uh, issues coming uh, from this optimization algorithms, strange things are happening. So research was going on in order to ensure that such networks are still being uh, trained. So why do we need millions of weights? 
For problems that we're considering, when you have only limited number of inputs, you don't need them. You just use traditional do-layer network, it's all fine. But when you do uh, recognition of images, images have millions of pixels. It means mi millions of inputs. And in order to recognize these images, even with the tricks on convolutionary networks anyway, you need many more weights. And that's why deep learning networks uh, uh, have been uh, used. So it's simply networks with many nodes and many layers. That's why deep learning, because there's many uh, layers. You could find also maybe analogy with human brain, then you know your human brain is deep learning, I'm not sure. So I think it's mathematically simply many nodes introduced and that's it. But there are interesting developments in these deep learning networks because they appear to be really smart in recognizing images, especially when you do special uh, pre-processing of images. You don't recognize every pixel, you recognize patterns like distance between brows, eyes and all this stuff. So there are devices, technologies developed in order to present images and videos in the different form, not in pixelized form, but in a different form, convolutionary components, which are functions in fact, and then there are specialized networks uh, to work with these uh, objects. So currently this research uh, stepped uh, ahead a lot, uh, last five, seven years, because even uh, they need, companies need recognition even in uh, mobile phones. And mobile phone processors are weak if compared to, uh, you know, uh, PCs. So you need to develop algorithms that would be fast and reasonably accurate. And uh, it creates additional pressure on, uh, on mathematical uh, support for such process. Interesting research happening in there. But there are a lot of publications in this area, so if you want, uh, you can uh, do it. Now, um, radial basis function networks, briefly. Idea of a radial, so radial basis function network actually is not a network. I think uh, my feeling is that when uh, this technology was developed, a lot of money, it was in the end of 80s, a lot of money for research uh, went into neural networks, and that was good. So many people renamed their algorithms into neural networks and got funding, which is fine, because governments don't know how to you know, really allocate research money, so people maybe used uh, some useful names uh, to get funding. I don't want to create analogies, but also uh, five years ago, I think, Verbos was giving a talk, and he said that 70% of National Science Foundation of the United States of research, 70%, went into climate change studies. So people rename their hydrological studies into climate change and all good. But uh, look, climate change is an important issue, of course. So you, if you could show that indeed your hydrological models help you to forecast whatever is happening in 100 years, then maybe yes. Of course, nobody knows if climate change is all going, global warming going up. Maybe soon it will go down. It will be global cooling. There will be new research in global cooling, you know, so and then they would rename it global cooling. So it's, of course, cynical uh, approach, maybe, but uh, it allows to develop science. All right, anyway, let's look at this picture. So imagine you have a function like this, black line. Well, actually, do you think that uh, global warming is forever if we continue emissions of industries? Is there a linear relationship? <clears throat> there are studies that show that this time series of, of temperature and rainfall are chaotic, Kolmogorov cursed hairs, so to say. So there could be moments when it goes up, it could be moments when it goes down. Physics say more CO2 leads to global warming, but why in Europe in 14th century it was three degrees warmer than now? There were no factories. There were no big changes. Why? Maybe it's a huge... Okay, cycles. So it's maybe geophysical processes of the Earth. It goes up, goes down, and we have no control of it. We do emissions, no emissions. Maybe 1% we add, but the rest is something we, humanity, have no control. 
Emissions are not good, obviously. They pollute atmosphere, so let's stop them. But reason is not global warming. Reason is ecology, environment. That's for sure. That's noble objective. But I'm afraid that <coughs> investing trillions into this, people think global warming would stop. Maybe they're mistaken. So perhaps uh, it will not stop global warming. It would clean up the air, wonderful, yes. But uh, maybe global warming would just continue. So I have to do other things then to prepare for increase of temperature. And maybe in 100 years it would go down again. Because uh, new ice age is coming, of course, you know. Because Mil Milankovitch cycles, you know, Earth wobbles. So uh, there is a periodicity in uh, uh, global cooling, of course. And we're in the end of warm period of, on Earth, there would be global cooling, ice age. Ice age would, would be coming. So I wonder, but uh, yeah, it's difficult to predict, especially the future, right? Anyway, let's get back to our ne neural networks. This is easy to predict. It's all clear. So look, you have a function like this. Then uh, idea of radial base function network or radial basis function is this. Let's, again, use the idea. We use simple functions, sum them up, and approximate complex function, like in normal neural networks. That's it. So that's what we do. Look, this is simple functions like this, you see? But if you sum them up, they would approximate complex function. Question is, how many simple functions you take? Then where would be centers of these functions? These are like Gaussian functions. Where are the centers? And what's the height here? These are three questions which you can easily answer by running optimization problem, which is very simple, actually. Much simpler than a normal neural network. So in fact, we use this summation of these functions here. Radial basis, because they have a center w, so they're the same function in shape around the center, just shifted a bit, so this center shifted somewhere. And we have coefi uh, coefficient b, sorry, another formula. So if we use Gaussian function, has nothing to do with Gaussian distribution, by the way. We simply use this equation of Gaussian function, this one. So sigma shows its width. This delta shows uh, x with respect to the center, and b is additional weight to make it higher or lower. That's it. And then if you solve system of, uh, e system of linear equations like this, you can find all these weights. Very simple. And if you want to get funding, you draw it like this and say it's a neural network. Sorry. That's what cynical people did, I suppose. Look, indeed, so this is Gaussian function. So these centers, we call them weights in center of centers. They're not weights, of course, but we call them weights. And then B are weights, and we call them weights. So first we uh, add, we, we push the dist x1 minus w into Gaussian function, and then we multiply it by B, and you get your output. That's it. And you draw it, you know, connecting connectionist model you can say okay maybe but for me it's just a simple formula like this nothing else and there are simple ways of finding this it appeared radial base function are quite accurate why again because they combine simple functions like this in an optimal fashion minimizing error also very nice tool and uh, if you want to use it, there were studies showing that uh, such functions for hydrological many rainfall runoff models work sometimes even more accurate than uh, traditional MLP networks. Right. Okay. We'll not go to other types of neural networks with memory. We just say end of part two. And I suppose we need a break now. Is it right? So let's have a short break. And then we have an exercise in linear regression and neural network using Veika tool. And we'll, it, it will require some time. And on Friday, we have lectures, two lectures in the morning, right? OK, then we'll talk about advanced topics. Uh, and if we have time, maybe more exercises. Or maybe we'll do some uncertainty analysis. Uh, not an exercise, because we it requires more time. It requires Python coding and stuff like this. But at least main things we'll consider. Okay, anyway, the break now. Good.
Yes, what do you want? 10 minute break? Yes, because we had a long break before, 10 minute break. So we convene at uh, 10 to 11. Seven minute break, enough? 10 to 11, let's do it, yes?